This is a course of lectures and discussions on economics. Having considered the way adjoining disciplines like psychology, sociology and politics help us understand how economies work, I now want to turn for help to economics uh, itself, though somewhat neglected parts of it in modern curricula. That is the history of economic thought and economic history itself. And these will be the topics of the next two sessions. By looking at two famous philosophers of science, Thomas Kuhn and Imri Lakatosh, we will come to understand how economics has defined and defended itself through time against those who have attacked it from different points of view. Thomas Kuhn is the famous philosopher of the paradigm, how paradigms persist through time, even though they seem to be subject to devastating attack. I think this is, it's very important that we understand the history of economics uh, because it guards us against the view that it's been simply an increasingly successful search for truth and that the history of economic thought is rubbish. It's r rummaging around an attic for ideas that are now expressed much better. And I think what we'll find out is that that's a complete caricature of the history of economics. <laughs>
she saw a bunch of economics at the LSE and she said, why didn't you tell us it was about to happen? And they said, ooh, I we don't know. It, well, you know. And then they eventually produced some, some lame excuse. But obviously, if economics can't tell you that the, mo the most important crash since the end of the Second World War is, is sort of coming, coming onto the horizon and it can't foresee it, then it's somehow not the best economic. Well, or rather, if it is the best economics, it leaves a lot to be desired. So I think it, it's that kind of thing that um, leads one um, to be skeptical. And I think the stock of knowledge available to economics is not greater than it ever has been. I think it's less than it ever has been. I think economics has been shrinking in its understanding of what goes on as it's become more and more mathematical. The shrinkage and the mathematics go together because mathematics is very precise, but it's very limited. Economists 100 years ago, 50 years ago, even 30 years ago, knew more about banking and finance than they do today. Because these are areas that are actually quite difficult to render in formal equational structure. So the fact that an idea formally um, grasped without mathematics is now stated in maths isn't necessarily an argument for progress because it ignores the possibility that a great deal of useful knowledge gets lost in the translation. If you study um, the history of the subject, you may penetrate the secret of what I call persistence without progress. That is, certain ideas run through from the earliest times to today. They're stated more and more precisely, more and more mathematicized, and they're the same ideas, and they, you say, well, where's the progress? And there isn't any, but they persist. Why is that? And to explain why that's so, I uh, want to introduce you to two philosophers of science, very famous. One is Thomas Kuhn, and the other is Imre Lakatosh, philosophers who explain the histories and structures of scientific disciplines. And they introduce the, the, the key concepts um, in, in, in the history of economic thought of a paradigm and a research program. But what is a paradigm? Kuhn and Lakatosh have said the reason why economics and, and, and some sciences, and, and perhaps they would apply to all sciences, don't advance in the way one thinks they should is that they exist to serve other than scientific purposes. Specifically, a, a science serves the interests of the people who practice it. So economics serves the interests of economists, and that means the existing generation of economists, not their successors, because what they want to do is they want to maintain their own position. They've invested in certain forms of knowledge. And the upshot of all that is that once a, a normal way of doing a science has been established, it develops strong staying power, however much its scientific claims are questioned. So let's start with Thomas Kuhn's idea of paradigm and paradigm persistence. A paradigm is a way of doing a science, he says, which becomes hardwired into the psychology and the structure of the scientific community while simultaneously be, being open-ended enough to leave all sorts of interesting problems for the defined group of practitioners to practice their skills on. So the paradigm directs researchers to the problems to be investigated, furnishes them with the tools to investigate them, and also the experimental methods required. The threat to the paradigm comes not from empirical failures, which can usually be insulated as puzzles, but from changes in the world view, which makes the puzzle seem intolerable. Um, a mismatch develops between the institutional map of the science and the problem um, which needs to be solved. 
Now, there are a couple of examples from the natural sciences. In other words, the world view of, of, of um, shifts, and suddenly the old science doesn't seem to be addressing it. Uh, the most famous example is the Copernican Revolution in the 16th century. And you had a view of the world in which the Earth was at the center of the system, and the Sun and all the planets revolved around the Earth. And that gave you measurements of the predictions of all kinds about the movements of, 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 the, of, the, of the planets in relation to the Earth, um, which were fairly accurate. They weren't bad. This, is, this was the Ptolemaic system. And Copernicus said, no, no, that's not how it works at all. And so out of that develops theories, gravities, and so on. But the point is that it was absolutely revolutionary because it displaced the Earth, the world, the, our Earth, from the center of the universe. And it had unbelievable consequences. I mean, we weren't unique any longer. We weren't uniquely made by God. So it revolutionized the way people thought about the nature of, of, of the divine and the natural. But it wasn't a huge improvement. It was a paradigm shift. But it, it didn't give you much better measurements of the relationships than the older system did. It represented a change in the view of the world. Now, you have um, another um, uh, one, which was the replacement of phlogiston by gas as the agent of combustion. These are real shifts in science, and they could be called paradigm shifts. You've had very, very few in economics, um, very few paradigm shifts. Two candidates um, for paradigm shifts in economics. I'm, th I'm thinking of a period from 1750, roughly, to today. Can anyone, can anyone think of um, possible paradigm shifts in economics that have occurred? I mean, the first one that comes to mind is the marginal revolution in the late 19th century that really introduced microeconomics to broader study, as well as uh, slowly started the trend of mathematization of the discipline. Yep, yep. I agree. That's the first of the candidates. You have this shift, uh, the mar marginal revolution at the end of the 19th century, and a shift from a cost of production theory um, to a marginal utility theory of, of price. Now you study marginal utility theory of price. Uh, whether you know it or not, you are studying a marginal utility theory of, of price, uh, price formation. That, that, and, and whether it's been introduced as such, I'm not sure, but that's what it is. But before that time, you would have studied a different, a different theory of, of price formation. What is it that causes prices to be what they are? So that's a one candidate. And then there's another candidate, I think, for a paradigm shift in economics, the Keynesian revolution uh, of, of the 1930s, 40s, which suggested that the market system didn't guarantee, automatically guarantee full employment. And that was, a, that was a major shift, because it had always been assumed that that was the case. The marginalist revolution wasn't really an attempt to overthrow the old system. It was an attempt to make it more general. The Keynesian revolution was more radical in its, but it, uh, in its intention, but it was repelled. The, the defenses stood, because what they actually ended up by saying, well, yeah, there could be some situations in which a market, um, uh, a competitive market economy, doesn't deliver full employment automatically, but these are to be regarded as exceptions, imperfections, special cases, um, sticky wages, um, those kind of things that, but the general rule is still valid. When a dissident theory penetrates some outer set of defenses, they all rally to close the breach that's been created and fight back, and usually they win. This is uh, not an idea, you know, you might think that's relevant to the way intellectual life um, uh, should, should, should go on, but it, it's very true to it. Now, we now come to Lakatos. Now, Lakatos is the other of these um, 
uh, theorists of science. And he gives a more elaborate explanation of um, why ideas persist. And um, that is through the notion of a research program and distinguishing between the constant elements in the research program and the variable elements. In such an enterprise, the researchers all share a common set of basic axioms. They all share a common, common set of ideas about how to do the science. Um, they all share a common set of working practices, a common technique. It's the technique you will study in your, in your, in your, in your courses from your textbooks. So think of it as three sort of concentric circles. You have at the core the axioms, you have the techniques, and then you have a protective belt, almost an outer belt. And in that outer belt, there is the conflicts take place in the discipline, but they don't, on the whole, affect anything that goes on in the core. That's where uh, dissidents can have their say, that's where um, the, the, they can be admitted or, or they can be uh, repelled. And the function of the protective belt, in the way Lakatos sees it, is to prevent a premature rejection uh, of the core, like an organism which develops an immunity to infection. You see, if everything the core says is now rejected by empirical work, the core eventually degenerates sooner or later. But because it's so difficult to disprove anything in economics, you try and disprove any sort of big idea in economics, and you run up against so many problems um, that it's very hard for anything from the protective belt, really, to damage the core. It very occasionally happens, but it doesn't happen that often, and Keynes came, Keynes and Revolution came closest to it. So what Lakatos says, really, is that the defenses are very, very strong. The protect, protective belt is true in all sciences. All sciences, according to Lakatos, have this structure, this defensive structure, which pr protects them against criticism. But in, in social sciences like economics, it's very, very powerful because of the weakness of the refutation procedure. As I've just said, it's very, very hard to disprove a theory in economics. Now, there's, there's other things that um, sort of tend to protect theories against uh, criticism. For example, John uh, Davis says that um, you have a whole way of judging the quality of research, which um, tends to favor the existing practitioners of the subject. A whole structure of research journals, which only publish articles um, by, uh, 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 really, people who do the, the, the economics in the accepted way. You have the ranking of journals. Every academic understands exactly how this works. If you have a new idea, it's very hard to get it published. And this is true now, more and more so, as government money flows towards research, uh, which is accredited, re good accredited research. And so the incentive to just stick within accepted, uh, accepted rules of research and not, pr not try and do anything new is much, much stronger because your department's research money comes from being published in a very limited number of journals. Those journals are controlled by the powers within the profession. So you can see how difficult it is to get new ideas um, through. One of the um, Nobel laureate in economics, I mean, this has often been criticized, that this reliance on referees leads to a much more conservative strategy I think it works against novel papers that cross subfield boundaries and that makes it all the more challenging. Basically, it makes the simplest path to publication in the top five journals to be high quality follow up papers. So if you want to get published in the top five journals, don't try and say anything new. Just say something in a slightly different way from the previous paper. And that gives you a reputation for originality. Now, we can give some examples of methodological sniping in economics. 
while the paradigms and research programs uh, have continued on their merry way, uh, there's been persistent sort of attacks from individual dissidents and dissident, dissident scholars about the methods of the subject, about the way econ economics is theorized. And these have been the main points of attack. One, unreal behavioral assumptions, especially the view of the human being as a calculating machine. Two, excessive math. Three, claims to universal truth. And four, um, demand for proper micro foundations. Unreal behavioral assumptions. Well, that's easy. If you think of a model, you have assumptions there. We assume A, B, and C. And people have attacked that from the beginning, that way of building up models. For example, I'll just give you examples of this. Sismondi. He, he was a, an economist of the 18th century. He wrote that humanity should be on guard against all generalization of ideas that causes us to lose sight of the facts. What about the idea of um, the human being as a calculating machine? Is that true to the facts of human behavior? Do humans behave in the way economists say they do. If they don't, then you're actually starting your theorizing by losing sight of the facts. That's been a continuous criticism um, in, in, in the history of economic thought. Richard Jones, a 19th century economist, look and see as opposed to see and deduce. Cliff Leslie, another 19th century economist. These are all dissidents. Instead of investigating actual motives, economists construct a fictional person out of the desire for wealth and aversion from labor. So instead of trying to look at actual motives, they say, here we present you with this person. He wants as much wealth for as little effort as possible, and that is our human being, and we deduce all the consequences from that assumption. Is that true? Is that pe people just want more and more money for less and less work? Well, it is. We all know people like that. But you know, is that a general rule? Doesn't it exclude lots of other motives that people have? But you know, the simplified model. And of course, that sort of model can be actually formalized. It, it can be made into maths very easily. So it's useful. Um, another one, William Beveridge. Uh, he has a nice, nice remark called economics a survival of medieval logic. Economists are people who earn their living by taking in one another's definitions for mangling. And I think there's a strong connection between economics and medieval thought, medieval scholasticism because you can't prove the existence of God. But that doesn't mean that people didn't argue and argue and argue and argue about God for hundreds of years, um, and about God's intentions and about, God's divine, and about the divine plan. But they could never prove it. They could never prove God exists. Why? Because they couldn't apply Richard Jones's motto, look and see. Now, too much maths, second criticism. For example, one Nobel laureate in economics, uh, Leontiev, attacked the nearly mandatory use of maths. Uncritical enthusiasm for mathematical formulation tends to conceal the ephemeral substantive content of the argument behind the formidable front of algebraic signs. In no other field, of inquiry has so massive and sophisticated a statistical machinery been used with such indifferent results. Most of these models have no practical applications at all. But they look good, and pages and pages of algebra 
give you formidable scientific sense of scientific authority. Most, by the way, most people, when they read these papers, they don't actually bother with the maths at all. It would take far too long to go through it all. So they assume it must be right. And the gist of the article is actually contained in the first sentence and the last sentence. And so all this is just window dressing. What, what is it? I can do it. I can do it. Therefore, I'm a scientist. In a similar vein, the British economist Frank Hahn said, it cannot be denied that there is something scandalous in the spectacle of so many people refining the analysis of economic states which they give no reason to suppose ever will or ever have come about. In other words, they're building models about imaginary states. And Harry Johnson, again, noted that the testing of hypotheses on which econometrics rested is frequently a mere euphemism for obtaining plausible numbers to provide ceremonial adequacy for a theory chosen and defended on a priori grounds. In other words, the whole thing is fraudulent. And economists from different schools, you know, very different schools, Friedman, Coase, Joan Robinson, Krugman, Stiglitz, all complained about excessive mathematization, but it's become the benchmark, you see. And their complaints have been like water off a duck's back. And you can't say about these people that they couldn't do maths, because they could. But they said, look, it is subject to such a big law of diminishing returns that um, you should really um, not, not use it as the benchmark of comp competence in the discipline, because that's what it is, really. It tells people, look, they can do the math, therefore they, they, they are economists. Now, I think um, you, you need to have a more sophisticated test. Claims to universal validity. Economics likes um, to um, uh, share one claim of the natural sciences. To put it very crudely, stones are stones anywhere they appear in the world. They, they, they follow the same laws. And so therefore, human beings are the same, absolutely the same. Therefore, any, anything that applies to a human being in um, you know, a, a little corner of um, uh, Europe, or, or to, let's say Robinson Crusoe, which is a fictional human, applies to all of them all over the world. They're all exactly the same. And therefore, you, ha you can have laws. Uh, uh, now, that's been attacked by lots of people, including many economists. Um, for example, the German historical school, uh, 19th century school, introduced the important idea that the validity of any economic law is confined to the period and the place in which it's developed. You can't say what was true in Germany about human behavior in the 19th century or uh, under those particular circumstances, was also true in France, was also true in China, was also true in India, and everywhere, exactly the same. I think that was the attack. And the reason was that unlike rats in a lab, you can't subject all these societies to the same conditions. Therefore, let's study <coughs> what works in some situations and, and you know, what what, what works in others and what doesn't in the two cases. My final point, the demand for tight micro-foundations. Now, what does that mean? This is one of the things that many, uh, many uh, dissident economists have attacked over time. And it developed really in the attack on Keynes. John Maynard Keynes tried to overthrow the existing paradigm in the 1930s. And one of the ideas he had was that human behavior wasn't as the classical economists said it was. In other words, human beings, in their behavior, um, they were motivated often by what he called animal spirits and by conventions and periods of excitement and depression. And, and, and these sort of quasi-rational um, uh, 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 attributes um, of, of, of human psychology explain their behavior much more than the calculating machine um, which you're taught about in, in your economics courses, what's called the optimizing agent. So what classical economics has tried to do is to say, look, you can't understand outcomes without um, starting with these individual calculations that people make, 
adding them all up, and then you get a picture of how the economy as a whole will work. That's what's called having tight micro foundations. Keynes and others said that's rubbish. You can't have tight micro foundations. These micro foundations may, may work in some individual cases, but to try and um, plot the trajectory of a whole economy um, from tight micro foundations ends you in, uh, you, you know, in, in, in a loony bin if you really try and do it that way. You're never going to get there. So these are criticisms that have always been made. And if you look at the history of the economics, you'll see them there. And then you'll wonder, well, why um, have they made so, so little impact or relatively little impact? And I've tried to give an answer to that, which is the defenses of the existing, um, existing um, profession, uh, professional uh, practitioners are so strong um, that they've been able um, to repel them and make sure that y the young uh, dissenters don't get preferment in, in the profession, that you only really get promotion in the good universities and publication of the good journals by following the orthodox line. But I, don't, I think it's, it's very encouraging, and this brings me back to why one should do the history of economic thought, to find precursors of one's own heretical ideas. A any doubt you may have had about the value of what you're doing in economics has been expressed by some economist in the past. And that should give one confidence that one isn't alone. Um, in other words, one can recognize oneself in great thinkers of the past. I think you feel less lonely by, by studying the history of the subject.